Delaware and I'm in a very very interesting studio workshop a workshop where works of art are made by a professor and we're going to introduce the professor and his grandson uh, here we've got P professor Doug Gibson and the Craig Gibson the grandfather and the grandson how long have you been carving I guess around 30 years <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about your background. You, 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 I understand that you're 90 years old. Is 90 right? years old. Not on any medicine. That's amazing. That's amazing. T give, t give us an outline of your background. Well, I was born in Trap, Maryland, 1923. My father was a sharecropper, and we lived on a farm there and moved around once or twice. And in those days, there wasn't much money, so he used to carve decoys with a hatchet and a chopping block. And This one right here? Yeah. And... Uh, we used to smooth them down with broken glass because there was no money for files, sandpaper, and all that, and it wasn't that plentiful. And he made a good-looking bird. And there were people coming by who used to take his birds and buy them, 75 cents or a dollar apiece, and they would uh, take them somewhere else and sell them for what they were worth. So, uh, what from, would that have been in, that, in those days? What, what was that? So what would they have sold for the second time? About a dollar or a dollar and a half. And that was good money in those days sure because... Uh, we needed a second income to what we were living on. And so uh, they were sold pretty good because hunting was part of the uh, way you had to serve and I had to uh, feed your family. And so that was an extra income. Uh, I used to watch that. I had six brothers and uh, no one cared about that work with me and I used to stand and watch him and I never bought it until I got around 45 years old and I was teaching college, and uh, I was teaching full-time full engineering at Delaware Technical Community College, and uh, rather than to drive home and drive back every day, I uh, stayed down, and of all things, I picked up a tile-cutting knife and carved out a small Canadian goose, Canada goose, and so uh, it was very popular then because carving was at the top of its importance. I went down to Salisbury to one of the Ward Brothers shows and I said to my wife, I believe I can do this. And I came home and I got started carving and I kept going. Those birds that I carved in those days are down in my basement. You only got to see them by invitation. They're so bad. So uh, I worked out all of my mistakes <clears throat> and found the kinds of woods and the technique I needed to get them perfected. So that's where I am now. I. Uh, do a burning detail so the bird looks as near alive as it possibly can. Some guys just paint the feathers on so I go into further detail. Well, I want to get back to more about your background, but first to Craig, uh, tell me, what, what do you do? And are, are you a carver too? Are you a student carver? I've only carved one in my time. And uh, have, you got, have, you got, have you got that? Yes. This was done back in 1998. I've carved this out. He taught me how to carve it and burn it and paint it. So I've only done one compared to his numerous ones. <laughs> and tell me, where, where did you grow up and, and what are you doing now? I grew up actually here in Milford for a while. 
And then later on, I grew up with my mother in Merle and Easton. And so now, right now, I'm a pharmacy student. I'm studying being a pharmacy tech. Oh, that's cool. And people are encouraging me to keep going to become a pharmacist, so I'm thinking about it. And you're going to keep caught, taking lessons from your grandfather, yes. too. That's indeed. Professor, let's go back a little further. Let's go back to the, when you were 45. Yeah. Now, well, let's go back further. Let's, where, did you go to, where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Eastern Maryland, uh, Robert Russell Moton High School. And uh, it was a white, black school in those days. And so uh, that was the only place we had to go to school. And I think the school had all 12 grades in that one building that was on Port Street in Easton. It's still there now. It's an yes. elementary school now. Yes. So, all right, from there, when, how did you, 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 you got your professorship? And tell me about that. Well, after I uh, graduated from high school, my father sent me to what was called Princess Anne Academy down in Princess Anne. And uh, I got homesick and came home twice. And so he said, boy, you go back to that school or are you going to work on this farm? And I left and went in the U.S. Navy. That was in 1941. And I spent four and a half years in the South Pacific from there. And uh, that led to uh, my coming home and going to college. What was your job in the Navy? And you were, you were at war. That was in war years. Yes, in war years. I was in the Signalman's Corps and I got out and got into the commissary department. And I ran one of the biggest bakeries on Oahu to feed the fleet and other ships around there. So uh, that was one of the things that changed me all around. And uh, while I was there, President Roosevelt died and they started talking about the GI Bill of Rights. I was going to go to, uh, I was going to leave the Navy and come home. But the GI Bill came out, I came out because I knew my family couldn't afford college. And so uh, Harry Truman, president at that time, said the buck stops here because there was a white Navy and a black Navy on Oahu. So the services were integrated. And I was offered to go to Corpus Christi, Texas, or Florida to be commissioned. But for some reason, I don't know why, I opted to come home and go to college, which I'm glad I did. So that's what got me on the track of going to college and trying to get an education. And then what did you do as a job while you were in college in summertime? I, I was the uh, steward of Tread Avenue Yacht Club in Oxford for a long time. I couldn't understand it, a small black country kid running a yacht club on the Chesapeake Bay, and I did that for a long time. Well, that's one of the most exclusive yacht clubs on the, on, on yes, the, it is. Shore in the state of Maryland. Yes, it is. And I stayed there for quite a while. The only reason I left was because my children were very small and I was gone too much. So I had to give it up and come home. And when I did that, I was uh, put on the United States... Uh, National Education Board, there was 12 in the country. I had 17 states, 17 southern states. We had to go everywhere in the world, Americans went to school to see what condition the teachers were, were in and what the schools were like. And I did that for a while, and again I had to give that up because the children were growing up and they wanted to see me. I was gone a good bit from my classes, so it was good for both of us. And how many children did you have? Two. My son went to Dartmouth and my daughter went to Northwestern. They were in Ivy League schools. That's why I'm broke today. So they were expensive. <laughs> yeah. All right, and then tell me, as an engineer, how did you, about your career? Well, <clears throat> in college, I was into uh, uh, technical drawings and engineering drawings. And uh, the very few fellows were into that field. And I really had my choice of whichever I wanted to do. And uh, I taught DuPont engineers, and I taught engineers from many companies, Chicago Bridge Works, and most of them around that was having engineering problems. I would start out in the fall with 20 students. When June came, I'd have about eight because of the four maths they had to go through. And uh, it was very good up until the last few years. Again, I was gone too much on the road, so I retired in the year 1988. So I've been retired 25 years. I was say, that's a long time ago. Yeah. And you, and you enjoy retirement? Oh, yes, I enjoy retirement because I have something to do. Well, first thing, when you want to retire, you want to have something to do when you come home. 
and I do have something to do with my play toys. I call this my playpen, and my tools are my toys. Well, let's 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 take a look at some of your toys and and uh, what kind of birds they are and how much time goes into it. Uh, a bird finished according to uh, what he looks like in his habitat. It takes him 80 to 120 hours. There's 17 to 23,000 strokes in a bird feathering him all over. And uh, I don't do one unless I do that. Of all the birds I've made, I don't think it's more than five that I got through with just plain bodies, except the cedar. Uh, you don't want to uh, disfigure this good looking grain with detail. Beautiful. So uh, that's one of the techniques that I have in doing one of them. And if the cedar has holes, knots, or anything, don't take that out. That's part of cedar. Everybody likes that. Yes, now, what does that sell for? This sells for $150. It should sell for about three or $400, but it's my own wood I got from my own property. I have sold them as high as $1,800. Now, show me, show me some of your favorites over here. Well, this is one of my favorites. Uh, during the fall of, this is what, 2013, this was one of my biggest sellers. This is a ball pate widgeon. And uh, this is the bird that broke me up from hunting. I was out hunting one day and two of them came, we were three of us in a blind. If they came on the left side, it was my shot. It came on the right side, it was his shot. It came straight in, it was the middleman's shot. These came by me, I shot the drake dropped down, the hen flickered on back down the stream, it was a running stream. So we got the, the drake and brought him in. In about 10 minutes, the hen came floating down, dead. And when I picked them up, they were so clean, it looked like they were just hatched. And I said, this is the end, I can't shoot no more. I, I stopped hunting. But I uh, did enjoy hunting. Well, that's, that's terrific. And how about this other bird here? This is the uh, North Carolina wood duck. I've given it to my grandson. Uh, they sometimes come at different colors, different times of the year. They are uh, nest in trees. And uh, in Smyrna, Delaware is a spot where there's a lot of them. I've, not, I've not, never heard that before. They nest in trees? Nest in trees. They go up in a tree and find a hollow and they will make a nest and hatch the young. And she gets on the ground and calls them. No matter how high it is, they jump. The fluff on their body protects them from being damaged or hurt. And they're good uh, parenting ducks. So... Uh, Are they this actual size? That, that yes. This is just about the correct size of the bird in real life. This is a pretty piece of wood. What kind of wood is this? That's aromatic cedar. It used to be used for fence posts and closet linings. You can find it on any farm and around any field. It doesn't grow in the woods. It's out on the open. And I started using that when uh, I first started doing carving. I've had classes where we made all cedar birds. Do you stain that? That's all we do is stain it when we get it finished. It's a beautiful grain, so they won't, don't want to disfigure it with detail. And yeah, how many hours are you have in this? I have about 40 to 50 hours in that. The sanding is the biggest thing. It sands very nicely, but you have to be careful when you're sanding it and not leave too many scratches. The holes and disfigures makes it more important to the customer. They like that. And um, is this how you start off? This is a block of wood where we start with, on any kind of wood we're using, we draw the uh, elevated view of the bird, cut it out, and then do a top view to get the uh, shape of it. And from there, we go into the other tools we use to cutting shape and forming and getting the bird underway. Well, show us some examples of some of your work here. Uh, when we first start, we cut it out from the bandsaw, the block, to this. And we go from this to the uh, Fordham, which is a grinding tool to get shape like this. And once we get to that, we start doing hand work then and uh, getting the bird smooth. That's one of the sanders that we use to get it to where we want it. And from there, you draw on the feathers in each part of the bird where the feathers are belonging. As you did here. Yeah, this is a cork one. This will last several generations, nothing to rot. And you can put it in the water the first of the season and just leave it for the whole season. 
there, there's not people that use these as decoys. Oh yeah, that's what they use. Call them the working decoy. No kidding. And what would this cost? Cost about eighty-five dollars. If you buy, I used to sell them about a dozen, about four to six hundred dollars a dozen. And they are lifetime birds. Now, do you have a website, or how do people get in touch with you? I don't have a website. I don't want to because when it comes to work for me, I'm going to give it up. I'm just doing it as a hobby. Let me ask you another question. Do you have a smartphone? No. Okay. He he does. I, he he, he doesn't he. know how to work it. <laughs> okay, show us some other birds. Uh, here's another bird. I was a class being taught at the Ward Museum, and uh, I was well into my carving, and I didn't need a class, so I took this. We couldn't do anything on this except for with a carving knife. No, no power tools at all. And uh, so, did you work with the Ward Brothers? No, I did shows with them. I did many shows with them. I knew them. We became great friends. I knew Steve and Ward, and I knew the daughter. And uh, they're both gone now, and the daughter's still living. So, uh, well, what would that bird cost, the one you just had? That would cost $250 because. That's amazing. Look at the detail on this. Yeah. And the one next to it is the same bird in his summer clothing. In the summer, the drake looks just like the hen, except the, I colored the head so you'd know what bird it was. People say that the drakes are prettier. It's not. They're just more colorful. The mallard hen is prettier. And uh, this is one of the smaller birds that's good eating, good table fare. One of the smallest of all the waterfowl birds, called the green-winged teal. So uh, you always find that you have to have everything in the flyway in which you live and have a mate to it because people want to see the mated pair. This uh, bird here would be mated with a drake, mallard drake, mallard hen. Would that be this bird here? or this is? This? No, that's a merganser. And this is also, uh, is this cork too or is this wood? No, this is wood. This is a merganser. This bird is a fish eater. A fish has no chance uh, to get away from him under the water. He can swim faster than the fish. No kidding. Yes. And uh, I get quite a few calls for them. There's two different kinds. There's the American merganser and there's the hooded merganser. The hooded merganser has hair that comes way up and folds around like that. So what's your favorite bird of all of them? When you ask about the favorite bird, I like this one because you can see the detail in all the feathers. It has to be feathered all over, and uh, the speculum uh, is what you use to identify different kinds of birds. So uh, notice the feathers are all over, and the beak is orange color, and the drake is orange green. And uh, here's another one. Hold on. This is the same bird done by one of the world's champions. And he won the world's championship that year on this bird. So I made a copy of it for myself not to be sold. I just want to keep it. Uh, you're showing your, detail, your feathers in detail. And uh, you have to put your name on the bottom. Let me see the name. Flip it over so we can see it. Okay. 2006. Yeah. That's why I've had it so long, I'm not going to sell it. And so uh, you have uh, two things when you build, make a bird. Will I sell it or will I keep it? Some birds you make you don't want to sell, and some, were, some birds break your heart when you sell them. Uh, I went to Easton to the Waterfowl Festival in 13. I sold seven birds. I sold two of my favorite birds down there. So uh, I'm a little careful about that now. But uh, when a customer wants a bird, you've got to make up your mind whether you're going to sell it or to keep it. But this is an exact replica of what won the World's Championship that year. Well, it's stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. I've had two people to beg me to sell it to them. And uh, I'm trying to hold on to it. Oh, I'd keep it. Hang on to it. Yeah. How about behind us here? Okay. Tell us what some of these. Uh, let's see. This is the canvas back, one of the most sought after birds in the bay. It was 
overshot for several years and almost became extinct until they got r regulations on them so that they wouldn't be overhunted. And they used to gather at the end of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge by the thousands until they built the second bridge. They took up their space where they wanted and they got out of there. And uh, let's see, this is what we call the black duck. Uh, one of the best eating birds in the bay. They have a purple speculum that distinguishes them from other birds. Uh, they are, it's really a black mallard. So uh, you're not wrong when you just call it the black mallard. And let's see here, we have another mallard hen. This is what we call the sleeper. Uh, all he has to do is close his eyes. Let me ask you a question about the, about the black mallard. Yeah. You, do you still eat them even though you don't? Oh yes, that's one of the very, very good ones. Yes, both mallard families are very good. <clears throat> and this is a uh, female widgeon hen. She is mated with this one, the uh, male and the female. And uh, they are very good eaters. These are the ones that broke me up from hunting. And uh, if I can reach over you here, this is... Uh, Gadwall. In the early fall, he looks so much like a mallard, you get him mixed up. I almost got in trouble because I was going to shoot one one time and uh, they were protected. And somebody stopped me and I'm glad they did. Now, uh, in the black duck, they like to see action sometimes. So this one's made preening his feathers. Uh, people like seeing birds are into action. I have here also one of the large birds that uh, we have around. This is a an owl. Oops, cool. have, have, a, have a seat so we can see it. Turn okay. Got, got a brush there. Roger! Here you go. Give me a brush there. I don't know what I'd do without you, fella. <laughs> Me. I've never carried it out to a show. I don't want to get rid of it. Now, speaking of wise owls, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you told me as an engineering uh, professor, have a seat, mm -hmm. that you worked on part of the space program. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, when I was at Delaware Technical Community College, International Latex over here in, uh, was it Felton? Where is that? It's right outside of Dover here, made most of the space clothing and other things. And they hired my students that I had graduated. And they did the design for all of their gloves and suits and so forth. For which Apollo mission? Eleven. Eleven? Mm-hmm. And some others, but we, don't, we, don't, we didn't know uh, which ones we were working on. All we knew they did the work. But that one, they did the work and they wrote us a nice letter. And I had a lot of engineering students then at that time coming in to take that class. And so uh, that was one of the successful things that Dell Tech was noted for its engineering program. That's terrific. Tell me more about, about what you did. Well, uh, you mean in the college level? Yes. <clears throat> well, in the fall, we'd have a uh, registration. And about, uh, I'd have a class for about 30 in September, and we got around to June, I'd have about 9 or 10 because they got out because of the math. So I stopped one day and told them, you don't have a problem with math, you have a problem with yourself. I said, math is down into four sections, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But there are times when we substitute letters and symbols for other proportions we want to get. I said, all you got to do is learn the, uh, the uh, Definition. definitions and the functions that they do. Didn't have any more of that problem. I went right back into big engineering classes. Uh, we, we did work for Chicago Bridge Works, too, and many of the companies throughout the state. The, the students were hired pretty good, and I stayed there 21 years, and I left because I was getting tired. And I was playing around with the carving, and I'd find myself sitting in class sketching a duck or sketching a head, and I said, Doug, it's time for you to go home. So I retired in 88. Let me go back a few more years. Tell me about 
But you were raised in Trap, correct? Trap, Maryland. Okay. Do you remember your grandfather or his grandfather? Do you, can you tell me some lineage, some history? Well, I can only go back to grandparents. I never knew them, but I understand I was born before they passed. I know I had a grandmother in Trap who was uh, a pretty popular woman because she supplied the wealthy families with domestics. All I remember is that I was carried to her house one day. She had two maids, and their maid's sons had a lot of toys. And everybody was dressed in black, and they were gone for a little while, and all of a sudden they came back. That must have been her demise. I, I didn't know her. I understand she used to hold me in her lap all the time, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. And on the other side of the grandparents, I know in Trap that there was a, in a cemetery, there was one spot that had a wrought iron fence all the way around. The man's name was Charles Gibson. That was supposed to have been my great-grandfather. He must have been a very good slave because the people took care of him very well. Big headstones and all. And uh, that's all I know about them. So your grandfather was a slave? Yeah. And uh, was his son also a slave? or when? No. no. Okay. No. Uh, his son was a free uh, citizen. But uh, it's not much I can tell you about them because out of my 11 brothers and sisters, I was one of them who didn't, uh, I wasn't old enough to know anything about them or uh, have any interest in that. All I wanted to do was just play. So uh, I didn't get to know all of them very well. So you, how many of your 11 brothers and sisters are still alive? None. I'm the only one left out of 12. And what's your secret? <laughs> I don't have a secret. I'm asked that all the time. All I know is this, I, I attribute it to this. Living on a farm, we ate organic foods and drank what we call branch water, out of the old pump handle hand water, and it must have been good for us. Uh, most of my brothers and sisters lived to be in the 70s and 80s, and only two of us got into the 90s. My oldest brother was the oldest living cab driver in Washington, D.C. He died eight years ago, and he was 95 years old. We just had to take the keys out of his hands. My oldest sister died four years ago. She was 99 years, seven months. She was a domestic in trap. Most of the wealthy families, she did cooking for them and did their houses and all. And her son was a chef at the Tidewater Inn Hotel in Easton. All of her children turned out to be good chefs. Uh, and one of the boys was the uh, chief of police in Easton for 39 years. At his retirement, they said that was the longest living chief of police in the United States that they usually get killed, they die, or they quit on the job because it was... What was his name? Walter Chase. Walter Chase. Sure, I know Walter. Yeah, that was my sister's son. Is that right? Now, you say domestic, so this is, these are people that would work, work for white, in their house. white families. Yeah. And how many hours did you... Your, did your sister domestic? Or, mm -hmm. Okay, and how many hours... To tell us about... what. What kind of work she did? Well, she cleaned houses and cooked and took care of the families for them when they went to work. So she would have one family then? Mm-hmm. Well, she did several families, and one of her daughters did most of five or six families. Her name was Elizabeth, and she died about five years ago. And when we went to her funeral, it was more whites there than it was blacks, and they were crying more than we were. So, no question, you, you never smoked? I smoked for a while. Yeah. Back in. <laughs> Trying to figure out your secret here. <laughs> I went into the Navy when I was 19. Didn't smoke. And for the uh, purpose of having something to do, I started smoking. I quit in the Navy. Went to college. Same thing. I smoked for about four or five years, and it carried over to the time when I started teaching. My children were telling me, Dad, you got to stop smoking, you'll have cancer, and this bugged me all the time. So I used to hide cigarettes all around, they'd find it, and gave them to Mother, and say, yeah, I found another pack of Dad's, I couldn't bribe them out of that. So we left to go to Florida, and I had a big camper on a pickup truck, and I said, I know one thing, I'll get a smoke down there, because when we stop for a break, they're not going to follow me. My daughter stayed right with me. Now, how many years ago was this? That was back in the early 70s, the late 60s and oh, okay. early 70s. All right. And I said, when I got to Florida, and I said, Doug, if you can come down here without smoking, you can go back without smoking. That's the last time I smoked. Okay, so how about drinking? I've never been a drinker. Okay. 
All right, so that's one of your secrets. Yeah. I Exercise. Yeah. I, I, I used to get up every morning and do 200 bends just to keep my body flexible every day. And uh, other exercise was done out there in that garden. I have a two-acre garden here, and I had, now people most tell me that that's what keeps you going, this, that, and the other, but uh, I enjoy doing that. Well, you seem to be in pretty, pretty good shape now. Just, yeah, I'm not on any medicine. And you, you said that, and you're, are you you're still doing your bends? Yeah, every morning. I, I haven't kept it up too much here lately. This last one month, I've been working hard for my church to build nativity scenes and things for a Christmas play. And so I skipped one or two days. But it keeps your body in shape. Uh, when I was younger, swimming and walking, and I walked to school when I was a youngster because there was no transportation for black kids. And I walked three and a half miles to school every day, except the days when the weather was inclement. So uh, those things kept me physically fit, and uh, the mental part, I don't know where about it. I was my favorite teacher's reader. Whenever the superintendents came around to inspect, they'd always get me to do the reading. I don't know why. I do know why. My older brothers and sisters always did homework, and I sat with them and watched them. They were four or five grades ahead of me. They allowed me to sit there and listen to them. So do you do crossword puzzles today? Oh yeah, I do that every day. I go to the McDonald's, I take a paper and do crossword puzzles and uh, word find puzzles every morning. That's a given. Now, do, have, you, have you adopted any of these habits? No, not many of them. Right. <laughs> if he was with, if he's with me, he would have. But I remember growing up, that's all they would do. They would go get the paper for crossword puzzles, and they would sit there and they would figure it out, and they would argue who would get it done first and who had the right answers, things like that. I never got into it though, but those those were good times. From the block of wood we shown some time ago, we cut the bird out like this, and we have to see the bird in the block of wood before we start working on it, and then we go from there. We smooth it down. We start with the uh, feather burning like this. Very few people do this because it takes so much time in uh, getting the bird to where you want to get it. And from there we come to one like this. We have to sand it down and put on a sanding sealer so that the paint will flow much better. And from that point on the bird can take weather or any other thing that might work against it because it's wood. And uh, some of them have extended appendages, which would be a wing extending from the body. We have to do this. Depending on the view you look at it, you have to do both sides sometimes. Because the wings are up, and you have to see under the wings. Hold it so slow, slow, so they can see it. OK, good. Look at that detail. OK, and then around the other side. Look at each one of those lines. Yeah, one at a time. OK, and then the other side, let's look at that. Same thing. This is the top side. And this is the bottom side. How many strokes are in the other side here? <laughs> I don't know, but it's. Plenty of them. Usually about 30 or 40 strokes in each one of these feathers is coming in here. And they have to be a, a growth size. Each one has less number of strokes in it as you come down. And uh, you have to be very careful to make it right because someone's always ready to tell you whether it's right or wrong. So now with that kind of detail, I don't see any glasses around here. Do you have perfect vision? <laughs> Almost. But when you get to the fine detail, I put on my glasses then, but very seldom I use glasses. And uh, that's the other thing my doctor told me that I was unusual. I didn't have glasses, didn't take medicine, and, and uh, it's going along pretty good. Call comes from the organic life. Well, and also we, we didn't mention, but um, your marriage, that, that has something to do with Oh, yeah. It, right? Ha a happy... Happy wife is a happy life? Yeah. Do we have a picture? We do. <clears throat> tell me about the... Let's show the camera here. Okay. Let's talk about when, when was this taken? This was taken when I was in college. Uh, I, uh, in the college where I went, you had to have meal tickets, and I was a collector at the door. And the tickets were the size of a business card. And she would have hers folded up to the size of a pea and drop it in the thing. So I'd have to open the thing and look at it. I think it was probably a attention-getting thing. But I uh, ended up marrying that same girl. And how long has, have you been married? 51 years. She passed in 04. And so uh, it was a happy marriage. And we had two children. 
One went to Howard University in Northwestern, and my son went to Dartmouth. He's old time. That's great. That's great. Keep that in mind. All right. Let's, let's see what else you got. Okay. I usually find a picture of a bird that I want to do. And after studying the bird feather layout, that's the big thing you want to get. You got to get the feathers right size in the right place and make the bird and build in an attitude. You never make one of his head straight forward. We don't sit around like this all day. So you have to put an attitude in the bird. He had turned right, left, sleeping, bowed, or something like that, or up in a lifelike position. And the coloring, you have to have a picture so you can get the coloring of them. This is the widgeon that we were talking about years ago, uh, a few minutes ago. And some of the others, uh, this is a ball pate widgeon. This is the blue winged teal, and this is the redhead, one of the most famous birds on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, you have to have those around to get the right feathers in the right place and the right size. And that's really hard to do. Well, this is what some of your tools are. Tell me yeah, uh, this is a chisel, dog leg chisel. So there's places where you can't use a straight set chisel, it has to be on a dog leg shape. And the knives are all different kinds. Uh, this is one of the most used blades that curves down and some curve out, depending on whether you're peeling off wood or whether you're cutting out a feather. So you have to have the right knife for the right job. And uh, you'll find yourself getting more than one chisel. You have what we call a right skew and a left skew, depending on where you're cutting. You notice all of these are right skew, and there's some that skews to the left. I'm noticing the back part of the tool, and this this is so well worn. Mm -hmm. So this is number four. Was it? Was that that, that's four that's my initials: oh. Douglas A. Gibson, the fourth letter, the first letter, and the la and the seventh letter. Uh, I do that because when I have classes, the fellas get their knives mixed up, and I have when they come in, I tell them to burn their initials on the tool so they won't have any problem with that. And you'll find that you don't just buy one, you have to have two or three. Because I work out here and I work in my uh, house and I work in my basement. So if I'm going to do something, I want a tool there waiting for me. Now I also want to see what you do with this bench over here. Uh, this is a bench that we sit on. When I go from place to place for the show, I sit down there and uh, do all my handwork. And this is a rotary tool. It takes wood off. You wouldn't get very far unless you had this. Now, how do you sit on this? Is this is you, you I, I straddle that. that. That's back my backrest, yes. And this is a burning tool where I use to burn the feathers in. And uh, if you're going to do a good looking bird, you're going to get a burner like that. And these are some of the tools I use in this Fordham. There's fine, coarse, and this is for contouring. Yeah, show, it, show it to the camera here. This we use for contouring when we want to make the shape of the body. Uh, I get into competition where you have to be one of the best. You just can't make a bird with a round body. You've got to get feather patterns, feather layout, and all of that because uh, you, you don't rate too much into judging if you don't have a good feather layout. So that causes us to uh, put the pocket, this is called a pocket, to put the your foot behind that. You can't have that just smoothed over. So, and, and uh, you have to take that tool and cut this out. And uh, under the tail and on the top of the tail, they have to have the feather layout. Now this is called the primary and afterwards, I'll put an insert in here with the end of the flight feather coming out oh, of there. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to have a wood that accommodates what you're doing and put feathers all over except under the bottom. You do the bottom if you're going to have a standing bird. I had a good standard here before I went to St. Michael's in October. Somebody bought that standard. So uh, you have to be ready for any request that comes up. Okay, and these are, what is this? Oh, these are acrylics. These are acrylic paints. The reason for that is that they dry quickly and they're water-based. And uh, 
you put this on after you have sealed the bird so that the paint doesn't be drawn into the bird and not show the, uh, uh, the hues you want. Seal the bird first, then you can put on the, your acrylic paint. Now, can and we and then, then we uh, put on clear satin finish to emphasize the paints. And the, even if you're going to leave it plain, it emphasizes the wood. I love that your shop is not all neat. <laughs> That's what everyone says. Uh, if you're going to do something in a shop, it's not going to be neat. I look at the guys on TV, they have a very neat shop, but everything is cut out and made so all he has to do is put it together. But when you work in a shop, you're going to have dust, you're going to have uh, sawdust, you're going to have smoke, you're going to have all that. Uh, that makes a shop. Now, DeCray, you had some questions you were going to ask. Can you talk about this duck here? Yes. This was one of my earlier birds when I was getting to uh, learn about shape and size and colors and so forth. I think this is about 20 years old or more, more than that. And I gave it to him some years ago. I had forgotten all about it. The beak has been broken, but we'll put another head on it. And uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, hold, hold up the, camera. the name of this one is Two Beats. His mother was pregnant with him. And I wanted her to have twins. She said she went to the doctor, she only heard one beat. I said she had to have two beats. We were going to nickname him Two Beats when he came along. <laughs> so that's, that's why we named this duck Two Beats. <laughs> Take it back. And so uh, I tried to get everybody in the family to do some carving. I gave everyone a block. They started out for a while, but they found it was a little more than they wanted to do, and I didn't push any of them, so they took what they had and went on home. I think my other son, my son, he has his yet, but he didn't do much work on it. He was not acclimated to this sort of a thing. He's a bookworm. He was a 4.0 at, at Dartmouth. The Annapolis Naval Academy and West Point came to my house and sat down and begged him to come because he was a top flight athlete, football, uh, wrestling. Wrestling was his big thing. He took the Milford Championship, the District Championship, the State Championship, but the Dartmouth took the Ivy League Championship. And he went into New York. He said he went to a recreation place. There was a guy there who was a champion. He said, Dad, I could have thrown him all over the ring, but I didn't. I said, I'm proud of you. Don't make a man look bad in his own territory. And the guys used to write to him and tell him, uh, he hurt his leg in football, said, I'm going to take you because I'm going to work on that leg. And the other guys used to write to him and say, Darrell, I know you're going to take me, but don't make me look bad in front of my girlfriend and my grandmother. He got all kinds of letters like that because he was a top flight wrestler. Tell me where people can, how they can contact you who may want to buy some of your beautiful cards. Well, I only give out cards and uh, they have to meet me at a show because I told my children, when this becomes a work for me, I'm going to quit because I'm enjoying it as a hobby. So where are your shows? Uh, I go to the Waterfowl Festival in Easton. I go to... Where are you at the Waterfowl Festival? You're I'm in the middle school on the Oxford Road, right at the front of the stage. And I go to uh, uh, the World's Championship in Ocean City. It comes in April. And I sometimes go to Virginia. And I've been to New York. I've been to Toronto, Canada. But I'm limiting it to within 200 miles of where I live. I don't have to be going to all those shows because uh, I broke the habit when the family was coming up. I didn't want to be gone too much. So I'm doing very well just staying in the, within 100 miles of my home. Well, thank you very much for taking time. Yeah. DeGray, good luck to you. Praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> Got to sing for your dinner.